We're doing eight marks of the New Testament church. That's the structure of the study, biblical study of the doctrine of the church, ecclesiology. We started out by looking at the headship of the Lord Jesus Christ. Everything else is, 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 is centering around that important doctrine. And it's not something you hear a lot of people preach about today. Um, you will hear the refer to some individual or individuals or some church synod or committee or headquarters, but it's extremely rare. Uh, you hear preachers talk about the headship of the Lord Jesus Christ in his church. And uh, that is important for us in getting a proper understanding. So we, we did spend a number of sessions on that. And then membership of all believers. Once you have exercised personal faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit uh, united uh, that believing sinner and uh, that person become a part of the body of Christ, a membership of all believers. And we are. this is where we are now. Leadership, God has appointed uh, some men. The qualifications are listed for us to lead his, his individual assemblies, the flock, for them to be overseers. We they are called elders or overseers or bishops are the different names that are used in scripture for these um, in individual, for these men, group of male believers. Then we're going to look at um, relationship within the body. This, this is an amazing concept. When we look at it, I think you're going to see Bethel differently. You're going to see one another differently when we look at the relationship how we should relate the fact that we are connected awesome teaching and fellowship another amazing mark of a new testament church uh, any church that would justify its new testament claims and affiliation must be a church where believers are enjoying dynamic fellowship living life touching transforming encouraging fellowship and then we are going to look at discipleship, the ultimate call um, of God in Christ for all believers, that we are to become disciples. We are to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. The individual believer must want to, must pursue that, must commit himself and herself to become a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. Nobody else can do it for you. You must want to. You must decide overriding every uh, everything else you do in life that you want to follow the lord jesus christ you want to be a disciple and also workmanship of god in the lord jesus christ how god is changed trans transforming our lives amidst the valleys and the struggles and your know, pilgrimage the ultimate goal we must never lose sight of we're becoming more like the lord jesus christ we pursue that and then finally we look at the worship of the triune God. How we as believer priests. All believers are priests. And just like the priesthood in the Old Testament. There are specific instructions. And invitation to participate. In the worship of the triune God. So these are the marks that will guide us. We are in a third session. Looking at the leadership of the members. Of the body of Christ. That which he purchased with his own lifeblood we we're looking at the personal call the public call and we look at the difference when when paul said very important in my mind and something we we we, we sometimes we overlook it if a man desires the office of a bishop he desires that word desire occurs twice there are different words in the original and it means it's something that we pursue because there are there are qualifications there are criteria and the reason why there are criteria or prerequisite qualifications is because we do have a job description. Uh, elders are appointed to function in a particular role, to be engaged in unique type of ministry that the flock can't do. These are the qualifications listed on the job description. As soon as we finish the job description, we're going to move on to the qualifications that are listed we're going to go through them one by one we're going to look at them from scripture and see what they really mean and to seek some clarification uh, for us today 
and there are so many churches that have different concepts about church, these qualifications. Even among us as brethren, we have differences of opinion. It is my intent and desire that looking at the word of God, we will return to what the Bible has to say. We're going to read some verses from Acts chapter 20, if you remember. The Apostle Paul um, came upon, came to Ephesus in Acts chapter 19. We have the recording of that. He came to the area and he found some believers uh, who did not even as much as heard of the Holy Spirit. And after that, he spent three years teaching in that church. And in Acts chapter 20 now, he called for all the church leaders in that region and he challenged them to shepherd the flock. Let me read some verses from Acts 20 for us. Verse 25, and indeed, now I know that you all among whom, now I know that you all among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God will see my face no more. Therefore, I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all men, for I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. Take heed, verse 28, take heed therefore to yourselves and to all the flock, among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock also from among yourselves men will rise up speaking perverse things to to draw away the disciples after themselves therefore watch and remember that for three years i did not cease to warn everyone night and day with tears very interesting passage as Paul addressed those um, Ephesian elders in that region, and uh, he was preparing for departure, not, not, not physically departing from that region, but basically a sense that he was doing his sunset years ministries, and he was heading home to be with the Lord in glory. And so he challenged them. So let's look at some of these um, duties. Um, the elders are to preach and teach the word, they are to take heed to themselves and to the flock, shepherd the flock, as we have uh, listed for us there in Acts 20. Eight, in Acts 20. Um, they, they are to watch. These are descriptions of their duty. And so we're going to take one at a time. Teach, preach the word. And we have some references here. Acts 6 2, Colossians 1 28, and 2 Timothy 4 2. Uh, let's take the one in the uh, in Colossians one twenty eight. Him we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom, that we may present every man perfect or complete in Christ Jesus. That's twofold role of the shepherds of the bishops of the elders to preach and teach. And I think I last we looked at the fact that teaching and preaching are different. Teaching targets the mind. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Do not allow the world to squeeze you into its mold, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. That mind is the word for the intellect the human brain and that's what we target when we are teaching we employ different methods different ways in fact people learn differently and, and that is why shepherding and teaching requires hands-on uh, there are people who once you meet in a group and you present some information they they get it one time others need to hear it again and again others need to hear it from a different perspective maybe not in a gathering but in a smaller group where they can interact learn at their own pace 
And, and so teaching must employ all the different methods, group, individuals, and so forth and so on. Question and answer. There's going to be difficult for teachers to ascertain or to measure where your students are if you're not permitted to ask questions or to, um, to seek further clarification. We have to find out how much of the material is being grasped and understood. That's teaching. Teaching targets the, the head, the mind. Preaching targets the heart. Preaching is about engaging. It's about doing. It's about practicing what you know. And so it's a good idea to have the teacher preceding the preacher. It's, it's a good idea. The preacher targets the heart to move the individual based on what information the teacher, based on the light given by the teacher. The person responds in action, in a change of behavior. We exhort one another to respond to biblical teaching. But they are not synonymous. Even though sometimes some of our teachers are preachers, some of our preachers are teachers. Sometimes we move between both roles. But usually, the preacher is the one that gets away with the difficulty of the task. See, the teacher dare not move on until the student gets the point. The preaching is a little bit different. It's, it's motivational. It's a challenge to get you to act. And that's why teaching requires repetition. You have to repeat. Whatever you have in scripture presenting, you have to repeat it over and over. One of the dangers of the ancient philosophers is that they were addicted to hearing something new. But when it comes to teaching the word of God, it's a little bit different. It's not the addiction to new doctrine. But it's a matter of different, different teachers with different personalities have different ways they present the same content. For example, you will find yourself, I'm pretty sure all of us have this, where there are some teachers that we can follow easier than others. And um, th that's okay. That's normal. Sometimes it has to do with vocabulary. Sometimes it has to do with style and the way somebody approached teaching. And so we utilize all of those different styles so we can understand. But the teaching and the preaching of the word are the sole responsibilities and primary responsibilities of the, um, the, the elders and the under-shepherds in, in communicating that. Also over in Timothy, 2 Timothy 4, 2, Paul said, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season. Be on the alert. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. So here you have the both of them again. Preach the word. And then you are to convince, rebuke, exhort with long suffering and the teaching. Those three things are so important. One, to be ready and to convince. Because People have different views from culture. They have different views from their past. Some subject like faith, God, redemption. You, almost every person converted to Christianity come with different opinions about these things. Yet the task is given to us as Bible teacher to convince the person that this is it. This is what the Bible is saying. This is what the Holy Spirit is saying here regarding redemption. And regarding all the other doctrines. And you rebuke. You rebuke with, 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 with gentleness and with love those who have erroneous view that they, they will not let go of. And so they have to be challenged on the basis of the word of God. And then those who have doubt you exhort. The word means to encourage, to implore. They are struggling with the content that is being taught. That's okay. Where most of us are today as Bible teachers is not where we started. We sometimes need to tell our testimonies. We, we had struggles. We have doubts. But as we apply ourselves to the Word of God, we get a better understanding. The Spirit of God illumines our understanding. 
So we are to remember when we are teaching that some people are struggling with the content of what we are presenting. They have to get rid of errors, old wife fables, things we have heard in our cultures, things that perhaps we have in the back of our minds all our lives. We have to get rid of those. Because the Bible said we are to, we are to exhort and we have to do it with long suffering. See? The teacher has to be patient. How many times have I mentioned this to you? You have to be patient with the person. Like I said, some people will get it the first time. And by the way, some of those persons who get the concept of redemption for the first time know they are struggling with the doctrine of adoption. So it's not like everything they get the first time. People, people are different. And so different methodology in teaching has to be employed until the person get the word of God clearly. Another job description is to take heed to yourselves and to the flock. And I, as you know, I'm passionate about this. I am passionate about this duty because it has been neglected among us as brethren. Other groups, I think, have a better understanding. They'll have retreat where the leaders go by themselves will go to a leadership retreat and they will discuss things in one another's personal lives and, and so forth. They'll confide in one another. They'll disciple one another. It's unfortunate that as brethren, we don't have this in our culture at all, even though it's there. Let me read what Paul says here in Acts 20, 28. Therefore, take heed to yourselves and to the flock, I walk you through this construct before, and I'm going to do it again. He said, therefore, and remember verse 27, he's warning. Should have that on the window, but let me just remind you what he said in verse 26, 27. He said, he knows that after his departure, savage wolves will come in among the flock. Okay? Well, actually, it's verse 29 that says that. But he challenged us that not only that, but false teachers will come from outside to attack and from inside. Now, how do you prevent false teachers from coming from within? By taking heed to yourselves. And there's a sequence here in that conjunction, and. In the original language, it's the Greek word kai. Sometimes it is translated then as a sequential conjunction. I think it, that is the element here. Take heed to yourselves, then to the flock. In other words, there's a, a matter of priority in terms of taking heed to yourselves. Watching over one another as fellow elders must Take priority over overseeing the flock. Take heed unto yourselves. And I, I, I explain, in fact, some of you share how much you appreciated uh, that equation. That if we have a hundred members here at Bethel, and among the hundred members we have we were to have ten elders, that means we would have a congregation then, a flock of ninety. But in the mind of each individual elder, each individual elder has to give an account to the Lord for 99 sheep. That, that is so neglected and misunderstood. It's not 90 sheep that each individual elder is responsible for. It's 99. Because your nine fellow elders is exactly include. Take heed to yourselves. This was a leadership seminar that Paul had. The flock was not there. Just leaders he summoned. And so you got to watch over one another. You have to care. Indeed, you have to shepherd one another. You have to feed one another. Everything that is done to the flock is done here first to one another. And when that is not done, there are serious consequences. And the enemy knows when, when shepherds are not being shepherded, 
he understands clearly the potential for schism, division, contra controversy, or when you don't have united leadership, the, the, the sheep is confused, the flock, the flock is confused. And so you have this, this passionate charge and challenge, a part of the duty is to take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Now that is also important we understand that is not the committee that made you an elder. That might be the process and the tool of ordination, but ultimately it is the Holy Spirit. And I don't want the elders so much to understand this as much as I want the flock to understand this. That it is the Holy Spirit who appoint these shepherds. And so it's important that we remember that the Spirit of God is sovereign. And so we have to yield to the authority and recognize the responsibility that these men have over us. This statement is powerful, among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers so god had a hand in it it may not be something that was a hundred percent supported by the flock whatever means or method the church has of appointing elders but at the end of the day the spirit of god has not lost control the head of the church has not lost control and so we expected to submit to them to these men because the holy spirit has made them overseers and here's a, a, another task that's mentioned here. That is to shepherd, which is coming up shortly, so I won't spend much time on that. I want to just go back on this particular duty. A part of your duty as under shepherds, as bishops and overseers and elders, is to care for one another in a way that the flock can't. If you don't speak in the life of your fellow elder, who is going to? You definitely don't want things to reach a stage where the flock becomes critical. Then they, they no longer trust nor respect the leaders. And so the office of the elder has to be protected by the fellow elders. Have to be. It has to be dealt with in a way that carries reverence because of the value of the flock. That which he purchased with his own blood is right there before us. So I just want to emphasize that again, that you have to take heed unto yourselves. The elders have got to realize they have a responsibility to shepherd one another and to speak in each other's life. And if it requires rebuke, reproof, all those things. It has to be done by fellow elders. Never ever should reach the stage where the flock is made uncomfortable when the, the, the failures and shortcomings of sitting elders are made visible before the congregation. Where are the fellow elders who should be shepherding their fellow elders? Silence is definitely not a virtue. Who when certain things, and it's a matter of mutuality. You want the same thing to be done to you as you are doing to your fellow elders. We are protecting the office of the eldership. And again, you know I'm passionate and I'm big on this. So the next one is to shepherd the flock. That's another duty. And the Bible is decorated with this particular illustration and motif of shepherd. More prophets have been called by the Lord from the field and the profession of shepherding than any other profession in Scripture. So we can learn a lot from that. I just want to bring two primary things to your attention. Every ancient shepherd in the times of the Bible had two instruments that they traveled with. 
A shepherd would not even go to bed. That is mean when he is sleeping under his tent and the flock is outside and there might be other shepherds up doing their watch because the watch was divided into three sections. Yet yeah, every shepherd who is going to take his break, never, never, would never leave these two instruments, the rod and the staff. Let me take the staff first. The staff is like a walking stick. It has a curve at the end that the shepherd would many times hold on to, not for walking in the, in the shepherd's um, duty, but he uses that now when the sheep that suffers from waywardness and you're ne never ever going to come across a sheep that doesn't have that inclination. That's why they're called sheep. All we like sheep have gone astray. It is within us to go astray. So the shepherd would use the staff and stretch it out, hold the end of it, and put the curve, the curved section around the neck of the sheep or the lambs and gently restrain them and gently neutralize that desire to go astray, to go over the fence or to go through the fence. The shepherd hold back that inbred inclination to do wrong to cross over the barriers and the boundaries. That's the purpose of the staff. Then there's another instrument called the rod. You have that right here in Psalm 23, the rod and thy staff. And the rod is, looks identical to a North American baseball bat. Heavy, solid wood. And the rod is never used on the flock. Never ever. In fact, to such an extent that when the sheep sees the shepherd holding the rod, the sheep would look around because the sheep come to realize that that piece of instrument is used when the flock is under attack by a predator. And so the shepherd will use that to attack the bear or the tiger or any predator that would threaten. Then the shepherd will rise to the occasion and protect the flock. One is gently, the staff gently restraining and the rod is used to clobber, even to kill any predator that endanger the flock. Because you see, the shepherd is to protect the flock at all costs under his watch, under his tour of duty. That's why he travels with the staff and the rod. And it, it, it is a serious instrument that is used to protect the flock. It, it, the shepherd is aware that there's an internal danger within the sheep to go astray. The shepherd is also aware that the flock can be attacked, can be attacked from the outside, and hence he has the rod, the rod and the staff. And those are two important instruments that is necessary in the assembly where the elders, the bishops are carrying out their duty. They try to be stern and firm when there's a predator. Another way to put it again is that the staff is a defensive instrument. The rod is an offensive when he's attacking the, 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 the danger that the flock faces. Very important that we understand these two and know when to use what. But just remember, the rod is never used on the flock. Never ever. Because you see, the flock is purchased. That's why it's of such value. You undertook the task of safeguarding, 
protecting. And then feeding is one. It comes with shepherding too as well. But I thought I would bring to your attention those two pieces of instrument. The staff and the rod. And also a part of shepherding is to feed. The Lord Jesus said to Peter, Feed my sheep, tend my lambs. And the word tend my lambs is a word from the Hebrew mothers, nursing mothers. And these nursing mothers would learn this process from the grandmothers, the older women in Israel. That when a newborn baby is not latching on and feeding, supplying the milk, it is not enough for the nursing mother to say, well, I've done all I can and there's nothing more I can do. No. The older women would just instruct the nursing mother. Sometimes they do it themselves. Wash their hands properly. Sanitize their hands. And there's a type of bush that tastes bitter. A number of them. And they would crush the leaves and rub their finger in it. And they would put it into the inside of the mouth of the baby. And all of a sudden, those muscles inside the baby's mouth starts to contract. It creates a suction. And that's the time the nursing mother will try again. And then they realize the baby is getting the milk. It's not enough. For elders or for bishops to say they have provided. Especially when it comes to lambs. You have to find a way to help to stimulate and activate suction. Once the person is born again, the Holy Spirit's presence in the believer's life creates a desire for milk, especially the new convert. Perhaps one of the most difficult tasks of any shepherd is simply this, is to come upon a believer or believers who have been saved for 20 years but they were never served milk and so the shepherds knowing the value of milk knowing that it's not a stage you can skip that is why it is difficult and even dangerous to just group people in one class because they have been saved for 20 years because remember now in your assembly you have a knowledge of what type of food you have been serving what type of spiritual nutrients but when you have a believer transferring membership from another church even another brethren church you can't just assume that because they are 20 years in the faith that they can handle steak we can't make that mistake. Your task is to ascertain, measure, identify where spiritually this person is. So you can either resort to that which was neglected or you can build on the foundation you consider firm. The assessment is absolutely necessary if you're going to really help that person to grow. Because you don't want somebody coming to your assembly, coming to your church. And after that person arrives, they enter into what we call a spiritual plateau. Where there are no mountains to climb. No. Paul said, I press toward the mark. And so it's important to be able to assess where believers are. So you know what material and how much the type of nutrient you should be able to detect spiritual deficiency in believers. Just like with our physical health. The doctors can tell when we are deprived of vitamin C or vitamin D. Or any one of these nutrients or B12 complex. We, we familiarize ourselves with these things that make believers mature. Believers don't mature based on the passage of time. Paul said to the Corinthians, 
I want to serve you steak, but at this time you should be able to deal with that. But guess what? You're still addicted to milk. The writer to the Hebrew puts it another way. When you ought to be teachers, you still need to be served milk. So the passage of time is no guarantee that somebody been 20 years in the faith that they are spiritually mature. It's what they have been fed is determined maturity and spiritual growth. And so when you realize the task, the duties of elders, it's very intricate and very thorough, really. Because each individual believer is really individual. You have to, uh, I've always made this recommendation when I get a chance and have leadership seminar that I think is a good idea if every group of elders in the assembly were to commit themselves to this habit. Each member should have a dialogue with the elders at least twice per year. Some churches do it once per year, but I believe 12 months is too long a time to let pass by without that one-on-one -on -one monitoring. But it's a good idea. If the elders meet with individual believers and to be able to measure and weigh and check and assess. Two years ago, there's this believer struggling with a, with a bad habit. Now, two years after your meeting and ask, how is it going? Now, the person is able to testify and tell you, I'm, I'm, I'm getting over that. Based on the recommendation of the elders and what they should do, you, you see progress is what I'm trying to say. Progress. It's a good thing to do. So it looks also a healthy practice in, ter in terms of developing good relationship with the flock. You just don't want to win somebody here that the, oh, the elders want to see me. You wonder what have I done? Because we don't have the habit of meeting in a mutual healthy context to affirm, to commend the believers, to encourage them. So when they hear there's an invitation to meet with them, they immediately they are thinking negative. Something I highly recommend is strengthens relationship and communication between the flock and the, and the elders. And so we know it is the, 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 the Holy Spirit who, who appoint these men to shepherd the flock. And according to the book of Hebrews, one day they'll have to give an account of their tour of duty in leading the people of God. So it's not an isolated assignment or duty. And that is the part that scares me, is that I have to give an account to the Lord for having undertaken the task to watch this body of believers that he purchased with his own blood. This is a severely important task, you would agree with me. Shepherd the flock. And then the disciples, each according to his ability, we have this in Acts 11, 20, 9, 30. Then the disciples, each according to his ability, determined to send relief to the brethren dwelling in Judea. This they also did and sent it to the elders by the hands of Barnabas and Saul. This, this, I want you to pay close attention to how the New Testament did some of their ministries in a business-like way. Notice this, they also did. You notice the, the they, plural, plurality. And they sent it to the elders, notice, not to the pastor, not to the elder, but to the elders, plurality. Look at this. By the hands, did you see the word hands in plural? By the hands of Barnabas and Saul. Why of all the persons, if you're giving Paul resources to carry, money, why do you need a Barnabas? This is not about who you trust and who you don't trust. 
I'm pretty sure they trusted the Apostle Paul. But you have to, once you entrust a believer, a brother, with resources, you have to protect the brother's reputation. How do you protect your brother's reputation? By handing it to two persons? I'm always amazed at how we just do things lightly and loosely and expose the carriers to scandal and allegations. No resource in the church should ever be entrusted to any one person. We learned that from way back in Nehemiah overseeing the building of the walls. And what they collected was counted and given to the Levites. And the Levites who received them counted what they received. Checks and balances. We, 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 we need to be sensitive to the fact that the enemy is waiting for shady things like these to make false allegations. It's one thing, you know, to have Barnabas stealing some of the money. It's another thing to have none of them stealing, but false allegations many times do far more damage than the guilt of when in fact one steals. I personally would like to see more policies handling church resources in our assemblies to protect those who serve and take the risk of giving account for finances and for property. But to protect, we, we, we are not home yet. We are still living in the land of the reality of sin. And so we need to be more sensitive, protect Barnabas by giving him a witness called Saul. Protect Saul by giving him a witness called Barnabas. The Bible is big in plurality. And we need to practice, especially when it comes to leadership. There's no need to expose leaders to questionable dealings. Because the enemy is waiting to do that. And you know we have seen that in ministries today and in individuals who will not hand over church resources to other people. We have seen the danger and what the enemy can do. Because remember, you know, he doesn't work with truth. He works with what? Lies and falsehood. The devil does more damage when he falsely accuses somebody than when the person is guilty. I, I'm going to repeat that. The devil gets more done through false allegations than when somebody is truly guilty. For the guilty will find mercy and forgiveness with God. The person who is falsely accused have no recompense. And that's why you put policies in place to protect those who serve and those to whom church resources are entrusted. We do not cast them in the enemy's den, the lion's den at all. We try to protect them. And then another important duty is watch. Therefore, watch and remember that for three years I did not cease to warn everyone night and day with tears. Verse 29 and 30 reminded us that from among us men will arise. From outside savage wolves, wolves are predators, will come in. How do you take care of those who may arise from among you? Watch and take heed to yourselves. How do you deal with wolves, savage wolves coming from the outside? Watch. Be vigilant. Paul said, night and day. When it comes to watching over the flock, there is no night that you cannot watch now any day. It's, it's a night and day duty. Because there are predators that are very clandestine. They work with the nightfall. And then those who are brazen, they come even in the midday sun. And you have to be vigilant. And I noticed that Paul said, here we have this, Dr. Luke says, Paul said it with, not, with tears. 
I remember vividly like it was yesterday. My youthful Christian life with my elders, elders back home. I can't remember any believer ever been disciplined. And my elders were not broken with tears. I remember that passionately about them. They, they, they had to do that which they didn't want to do it. But they have to do it because it's their duty. They had no pleasure in this fellowship anybody. Or even warning somebody. But that's a part of the duty. Put it this way. Shepherding is a dirty job. Shepherds sometimes find themselves, they smell like sheep. It's mingling, it's being down there with the people. And sometimes it's one and one, you have to beg, implore, beseech. Are the words we, we use in English for wherever you see that word, exhort, implore, beg, that's it. Paul in tears begs some believers to cease and desist, to give up certain habits, <clears throat> to yield their rights with tears, passionately appealing to them um, in, uh, in a very, very, very tearful way. Another important duty of the elders, as we wrap this up, is correct error. Wherever truth is declared, error always try to get in. And you realize the church is not different in like the, the society. So the church is a sociological institution where people interact. Truth and error are important here. And one of the most uncomfortable duty I think of an elder is that of correcting error. Today we is, is as if it's an invitation for believers to have their own opinion about biblical doctrine. The church is not the place for us to protect opinion. You do not have the right to your own doctrine in the church. This has been entrusted to the elders. And they have to rise to the occasion. It's uncomfortable. Listen to this that we have in Acts 15. And when they had come to Jerusalem, they were received by the church and the apostles and the elders. I, I just love this. They were received by the members, a membership, by the apostles and by the leadership. And they reported all things that God has done with them. Testimony time. Not finished. But some of the sect of the Pharisees who believed rose up, notice they believed they were Christians, saying it is necessary to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. Does it ring a bell? Oh, we have them around today. They are called the Seventh-day Adventists. They are the ones to which Paul wrote the book of Galatians. Those who tried to impose the Old Testament laws, including the dietary laws, Telling you what you eat, what you shouldn't eat. Requiring Gentile converts to be circumcised. He came across these men who were misled. In fact, the very thing that the Apostle Paul is addressing here in Acts chapter 15. Is the very thing the church council dealt with right there in Acts chapter 15. With the Apostles said, we are not going to bring this burden that we nor our fathers couldn't keep. We're not going to put it on the converts. That they should keep the law of Moses or they should be circumcised. Let me share with you quickly how uncomfortable and difficult it was for the apostles to address this issue. Do you realize that all the apostles that the apostles involved in this were all circumcised? Well, you know the apostle Paul told us in the book of in the book of Philippians chapter 3 that he was circumcised on the eighth day and of the stock of the tribe of Benjamin, remember? All the Jewish men and these are adult men were circumcised 
from they were eight days old. So they were circumcised. The members of the Pharisees who are converts to Christianity are men who would have been circumcised. Yet the Apostle Paul in writing other places said this amount to nothing. Here we go. Listen to me carefully now. When you get Israel mixed up with the church, that's precisely what you demand. And that is why historically brethren has always recognized that. Change of dispensation. That the church is different from Israel. Of course, if you are in Israel, you have to be circumcised. It's the mark of the covenant that God established with Abraham way over there in Genesis chapter 16. And it's a perpetual mark, God said. But if the church is not the Abrahamic covenant, it was a mystery hidden in God, as Paul tells us in the letter to the Ephesians. So in other words, then, that was an, a monstrous error. But the apostles the apostle rose to the occasion, and the men were rebuked. And here's a letter they wrote there. And they wrote this letter by them. The apostles, the elders, and the brethren. Wow. I'm still waiting to see that somebody's name. Pastor Brown. No such thing. Look up the men writing the letter. The apostles, the elders, and the brethren. I just love that. Plurality, authority. To the brethren who are of the Gentiles in Antioch, Syria, and Cilicia. Notice the writers, the apostles, the elders, and the brethren. Notice the recipients. To the brethren who are of the Gentiles, because it's only Gentiles, clearly, like I said to you, all the Jews there converted already circumcised. But they wanted, some of them wanted the Gentiles to be circumcised. And that's when their apostles rose and corrected error. I don't see that much in our assemblies today at all. And there are far hmm. more error today in the churches than when the apostles were around. Everybody have their own opinion. Especially in a culture and society where we are free of freedom of speech. And we come to church with the same thing. We are highly opinionated. Well, we need to surrender to biblical authority. When the Bible says something, that's what the Bible means. And just like the elders are under biblical truth, so all believers are under biblical truth. We're going to see this when we come next week and we're going to look up the qualifications. These are the type of men that God wants to lead his church. These qualifications are not negotiable. They are not there for us to pick, choose, and refuse. It's a part of biblical authority. Father, we thank you for your word. And we thank you that you have exalted your word above your name. It is settled forever in heaven. Bring us back to biblical authority. Bring us back, we pray thee, right here at Bethel to thus says the Lord. And give us the conviction but what you require from us is not a discussion, but obedience that is required of us. Help us with that. I will walk in obedience to your word. Not just for our sake, but for Jesus' sake we pray. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Amen. 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 Amen.